Coming up today, a bullish bounce, with S&P having its best day since 2022, thanks to better than expected jobs data. Have we seen the worst of it, or is now time to buy tech stocks? Palantir jumps 11% on Microsoft partnership, how the market can predict the presidential outcome, Bitcoin bounces back, along with oil. It's a bullish day out there, guys. Let's go. And a warm welcome back, everybody, to your favorite financial channel. My name's Jared, and every day I keep you updated on everything important happening across financial markets, along with following the data and what the technical price action is telling us. And I wonder how all those so-called gurus are feeling today after on Monday calling for an emergency 50 basis point rate cut. Some even called for a 75 basis point. Some of the biggest channels out there saying we're going into a 50, 60 percent crash. We're already in a recession, and of course we could see lower on the S&P 500. However, how good is the market at doing a gotcha moment? However, if you were tuning in with your favorite optimistic bull, Jared from Click Capital, you wouldn't be freaking out, and instead you would have been buying the dip, just like I was on Monday morning, taking advantage of maximum fear. And so we're getting a pretty good bounce here today. Look at the market color, green, pretty much right across the board. Up the front, still not completely out of the woods just yet. However, we are getting some constructive signs. And who knows, there is the potential we could see a V-shaped rally. However, like I've been saying, I'd be surprised if the market didn't come down and touch 5,000 for the election over the next two months. That would kind of be the best case scenario. And we still have the macro backdrop out there for some continued volatility. But for the here and now, we're getting some good signs, especially Especially on volume breadth today, almost seven times more volume in advancing stocks than declining stocks on NYSE. Similar prints we got back in October, November last year when the market made a significant bottom. Good sign on breadth as well. Stocks above the 200 day average seeming to bounce back. That's definitely what we want to see in this bull market. More than half of all stocks stay above their long term 200 day moving average. Still pretty soft though on 52 week highs. Still being outpaced by stocks making 52 week lows. So we're still not all there yet on market breadth. Another VIX crush though, still pretty elevated at 23.7. Still a lot of people buying puts. We can see that in the put call ratio. And the good news is we've got bond yield stabilizing. This is what I'd been looking for. 10 year to defend this big support zone and get back around 4% which it is at right now. Just like I told you guys on Friday afternoon, there'd be a lot of people chasing bonds come Monday morning, and they've continued to do a pullback today. Lower lows, lower highs, but on really low volatility and volume, it could be setting up for a dip buy on TLT here, as it's got the strong tailwind from the Fed cutting rates. More good news in the credit markets, high yield bonds. Now closing above their 50 day VWAP for the first time this week. Dollar index, holding ground at 103. And another sign I'd been looking for, the Aussie Yen, showing some pretty good stabilizing and firming price action here. That's an indication of the yen carry trade. And so now I think there's a good chance we may have already seen the worst of it on this capitulation candle to start the week. Still a good chance we could come down and retest the mid-level of this candle. That wouldn't be surprising. However, these lows down here may very well be defended. Great news for Bitcoin rallying as I speak back above the 50 day VWAP, $62,000 a coin. Just like I told you guys two days ago, there was a bullish catalyst this week for Bitcoin with Morgan Stanley given the green light for its 15,000 advisors to recommend Bitcoin ETFs to all their high net worth clients. Getting a little perk up in gold today as well. Appears to be a bit of an everything rally. And crude oil, holding ground, $76 a barrel. Still got a bit of work to do in the growth sectors versus defensive sectors. High beta stocks versus low volatility stocks. And there's a look at the spread between small caps and S&P 500. Still holding above their 50 day. But we've still definitely got some weakness in discretionary stocks versus staples. And stick with me today because I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about the uninverting bond yield curve, which is very close on the 10 year and two year going back to uninverted. And we'll go back in history and have a look at what tends to happen once that goes uninverted. And I'll show you some other economic indicators on the chart as well. I think you'll find that really interesting. Sharp bounce back in high yield credit spreads over treasuries there. Pretty much green across the board in all sectors today. Semi still really volatile as a group up 6.3% today. And the defensive sectors still finished green, but not as much as the other growing sectors out there. Aerospace and defense now getting back above its 50. Momentum and growth clear winning factors today. Got a nice bounce in the cannabis sector after it's been weak for a few months with some potentially positive rhetoric coming out from Trump. And I'll touch on that a bit later on as well. Just looking at the largest stocks in the market, there's Apple, Microsoft still holding ground, Meta looking good, and Nvidia getting back above that earnings gap support zone as well. Another stock that was a great dip buy on Monday morning, Arm Holdings. After it opened at 98.50, and it doesn't look like it, but it's already up 20% from Monday morning. And if it were to get back to its 50-day VWAP 
at some point over the next week or two. Even if the 50-day VWAP comes down to 135, that would be a 38% gain off Monday's opening print. So a nice bounce there for the semis. I'll also touch on Intel later, show you valuation and some insider buying going on in there. Looking out across the market, financials green, energy green, materials green. Same with industrials. A lot of bullish breadth out there today. Most names higher. I'll also show you the latest results from Eli Lilly. A good bounce back there. And so there's a look at the one-day heat map from the market. Only thing that was really red was utility. Not by much, just taking a bit of a breather. They have been performing really well this year. Other than that, it was pretty good moves in just about every sector. However, just switching the heat map to a one-week performance, quite checkered. A lot of red in tech and semis. Spots of green in the defensive sectors. Staples and a little bit of healthcare as well. Just switching the heat map again to one month performance, mega cap tech. Nvidia still off 22% in the last month and we can more easily see that defensive rotation in utilities, healthcare and REITs have been performing really well along with consumer defensives as well. And so while we got a good bounce in the stock market today, there's a better than expected print on jobless claim. Economists had been expecting 240,000 Americans to file for unemployment benefits last week, actually came in at 233,000. So that spooked the market last week with that unexpected jump in the unemployment rate to 4.3%. However, like I've been pointing out, that might have been skewed a bit by some external factors. Huge amount of immigration, increasing the amount of people available to work. Jobs market still normalizing from COVID and the record amount of people that couldn't work last month due to weather. And so the market normally doesn't react too much to the weekly jobless claims numbers we get. However, this print was a bit more important as the market's trading off this narrative amongst a few others. So that was a good sign to see because if that came in a bit hotter than expected, more people filing for unemployment claims, market may have sold off. And there's a look at the trend in weekly jobless claims over the last year. And we had been trending up for sure. Have we got a good print today? That could still be week to week noise. Moving average is trending higher. So for sure, the jobs market is still softening. However, it didn't accelerate and break out today. So the market seemed to like that. And so what investors are paying attention to is two big things. The cooling economy, the jobs market, is that just going to soften or is it going to spike in unemployment? And corporate earnings, are they going to continue to hold up? Are analysts continuing to expect more double-digit growth ahead, which it appears they are? And what's the probability of us getting a recession in the next six months, which I would say is still quite low. However, don't be fooled by just one great day of performance. We're likely to still see the more volatility ahead, still the real fear of a recession. We still don't know for sure whether the Japanese yen carry trade unwinding has been done. Still some uncertainty of how much the Fed is going to move next month. And like I've been saying, even in the heat of the moment on Monday, I still think they'll cut 25 basis points next month instead of the widely expected 50 basis points. And wouldn't it just blow us all away if he came out and didn't cut at all? j Powell would have to have pretty big guts to do that. However, I think he will cut 25 basis points and likely trim again in December when they meet on the 18th, just before Christmas. Looking back in history, real great chart here from isabelnet.com. Typically see some net outflows into equity mutual funds and ETFs around this time of year. That can add a bit of weight to the market. And in fact, the month we're in now, Looking back in history over the last 100 years, it's typically the second month where we see the most amount of volatile days, with October being number one and September coming in at number five as well. So like I said, this is often a volatile, weak kind of consolidating period in the market. So I wouldn't be surprised to see S&P 500 at 5,000 and who knows, a couple of more external shocks, maybe 4,800 or even 4,600 before we get the election. However, counteracting that, looking at Morgan Stanley's Global Risk Demand Index, it's an extreme fear territory, which just like the CNN, Fear and Greed Index that's widely referenced in financial media, it's still an extreme fear territory as well, often associated with market bottoms, still a lot of people on edge, and we can see that in the spike with the amount of people searching for recession coming into this week. Sharply going up, however, just looking at recent corporate earnings calls, CEOs, CFOs, they're not really talking about a recession too much. And just like in data we got on Monday, retail was offloading a lot institutional was buying that dip. And we're approaching the end of Q2 earnings season. 82% of S&P stocks having reported. It's coming in pretty good. Looking at the entire index, trailing 12 month earnings per share, $219 and trending in the right direction. We've even got UBS coming out and saying, current backdrop is similar to one where it was a great time to buy tech stocks. And that is quite a bit of contrarian call. And of course, full of risk because tech and semis have performed so well, they could easily pull back a lot more. However, if they bounce, they could have an epic bounce. Companies are still growing a lot. The AI boom is still pushing forward. And we saw that in the price action of Palantir today, jumping 11% after announcing a partnership with Microsoft to sell artificial intelligence to US defense and intelligence agency. 
Like Dan Ives from Wedbush Securities calls Palantir the Lionel Messi of AI, a very close relationship with the government, especially with these heightened geopolitical tensions around the world, which aren't going to go away anytime soon. Palantir already generated 54% of its revenue from government clients during the second quarter. Just came in with a really good earning a couple of days ago. And the good thing is when you sell to the government, you've got a pretty good big and stable buyer, regardless of what's going on in the economy. Because even if we do go into a recession next year, no doubt valuations and multiples will compress across the board. However, Palantir's actual revenue from the government should be stable. And so we're close to breaking out to fresh 52 week highs here. Pretty good price action on above average volume. And like I said, Monday morning was a great buy the dip opportunity, 21.74. And so just in the last couple of days, we're already up over 34%. And I continue to remain long this stock and I'm excited about its future prospects. The other big one today was Eli Lilly having a really good pop and regular session after reporting significant sales growth. Revenue for Q2, 11.3 billion, way above Alice expectations of just under 10 billion. EPS 392 versus estimates of 276 and really good revenue outlook coming in above Wall Street expectations as well. This GLP weight loss drug, another secular trend, definitely changed the market. So pretty good bounce there to start the session above the 50 day however. Looks like money came in and took advantage of that. Sold it off into the close. Still finished up almost 10%. And this has been one of the best performing stocks over the last couple of years, thanks to the launch of those new generation of weight loss drugs. Who hasn't been performing so well of late? Intel getting left behind the semiconductor AI boom. And it's just amazing seeing companies change over the years. For so long, Intel was head and shoulders above the rest. It was the top dog. If you'd told a lot of people 10, 15 years ago that Nvidia would have a market cap 30 times larger than Intel, people would have thought you're crazy. But here we are, and that's what we've got. However, the CEO thinks it might be a bit overdone. He just bought 12 and a half thousand shares for about a quarter million. Not a huge purchase. However, it could be the start of a few more to come. May see some other insiders jump on board. They tend to cluster their purchases and sales together. He may also be trying to signal to the market that he thinks it's cheap, confident of a turnaround. He still believes in it to give the stock a bit of a pop today up 8%. Still pretty heavy here after their bad earnings last week. Huge miss. So we'll see whether that can hold ground at $20 a share. And we'll see whether the CEO can restore confidence among investors. Because just looking at some measures, Intel just of yesterday trading below tangible book value per share. That's basically the sum of all assets minus liabilities and doesn't look at intangible stuff on the balance sheet like goodwill. So if the company was liquidated, in theory, the liquidation value would be $19.50 a share. And you really see quality blue chip stocks trade under their tangible book value. It's normally market crashes, bear market. And if they do, they don't normally stay there for long. A little less known, but also reporting pretty good result today was Sweetgreen. And I was recently in LA, staying in the middle of the city, and I was finding it hard to find a decent meal on the go. So much junk around. However, I ended up visiting Sweetgreen a lot. Found they had really quality ingredients for a reasonable price as well. And so their business has been growing really well. Port of Q2 revenue, 184 million up 21% year over year. Opened four new restaurants Q2. And even though they missed analyst expectations, the market's loving the result. After hours as I speak, just looking at a five minute chart, up a huge 24% and still a relatively small company. Market cap of 3 billion. It's been performing pretty well this year. And who knows? Maybe with those GLP weight loss drugs, consumers are starting to make healthier choices with what they put in their body. Just moving on to the presidential election and got some interesting data here. I thought I'd share with you guys. The stock market could help predict the winner of the presidential election. It's looking back since 1928, the S&P 500's performance in the three months before the election is a key indicator to watch. Apparently with an 83% accuracy rate. And that is since 1928, when the S&P 500 was positive during the three months leading up to an election, which just started this Monday, 5th of August to the 5th of November, the incumbent party, that means the Biden administration, remained in control of the White House 80% of the time. However, if the stock market prints a negative return in the three months leading up to the election, the incumbent party lost the election 89% of the time. So in other words, if the stock market finished lower from this Monday to the election, looking back in history, that would favor a win for the Republicans. If not, it would favor a win for the Democrats. Of course, like any indicator, it's not right 100% of the time. However, 83%, 89%, pretty hard to argue with. Also, good news for cannabis investors like myself. We haven't heard much from Trump on this subject for a while. He had previously spoken against it, as he pretty much comes from that conservative 
place of thinking on the subject. However, the times are a-changing, and he just said today that he plans to make a statement about this issue soon. We do have an upcoming referendum in Florida on adult use, so that will play a key role in it now that he's a resident in the state. But he'll pretty much just go in the direction of the majority of his voters. If he thinks there's at least 55-60% of people in favor of it, then so will he, just like he's flipped on crypto. So I'm hoping for good things to come out in this area with Trump if he does win. However, I think regardless of who takes the White House early next year, it's just a matter of time before we see federal legalization of cannabis in the United States. But of course, it's going to be a volatile and bumpy ride till then. Okay, so getting over to the global macro, and first we'll start off with probably the most important indicator in finance, the bond yield curve. The difference between the yields between short dated bonds and long dated bonds with the most common being the difference between the two year and the 10 year. So typically in history, if you've got the two year yielding more than the 10 year, that's the bond market saying they're worried about the economy. They think rates will have to be lower in the future. And that's why they start marking down the yields on long dated bonds. But when that inverts, looking back in history, that can be a good indicator of an upcoming recession. Okay, so in trading view, they actually have a native symbol for the spread on the 10 year and the two year. And like we can see, that's quickly approaching break even going from inverted to uninverted. Here on the chart shaded in the gray are US recessions. That's when the economy contracts, GDP goes negative. So we got a brief inverted bond yield curve in August 19. And of course we had that sharp recession in March 2020 with COVID. Now let's go back in history and have a look at previous instances of the bond yield curve going inverted and uninverted and then the distance until the recession. So back here in late 2005, it went inverted. However, it went uninverted back in mid 06, then dived back down again and late 06, and it wasn't until start of 2008, US economy went into recession. So there's two ways you could look at it. You could say it went uninverted in March 06, you could say it went in March 07, or you could say it went in June 07. From the furthest point, that was almost two years. Otherwise, it was more about nine months from when it really went back into positive territory before we got the recession. Just going back again, bursting of the tech bubble, early 2000, long dated bond yields went down, uninverted in December 2000, it was only three, four months later, US economy went to recession. Going back again in the late 80s, uninverted at the start of 1989, zigged and zagged a bit. How have we got the recession in August 1990? So from the first uninversion, a bit over a year, going back further again, a bit messy there in the late 80s, zigging and zagging. Economy was dealing with a lot of inflation, really high rate, bit of volatility in markets, kind of uninverting during a recession. Prior to that, we don't have much data to look at. The point is, it could zig and zag for a little bit. And just looking back in history, it can be anywhere from four months to over two years before the recession comes, just looking at this indicator. Again, you'll see big finance channels, some who have hundreds of thousands or even millions of followers are screaming that we're in a recession now, the stock market's about to crash 50 or 60%. And sure, that could happen. However, the odds and data just don't point to it happening right now. And I'll show you a bit more on why I think that's the case. For starters, we've got one of the most important economic data prints out. The leading indicators looks at a lot of leading indicators in the economy. That's actually trending up. You can see it was trending down going into COVID. It's a big trend down going into the GFC. And again, it was trending down after the tech bubble burst. And again, it was trending down pretty much every time we go into a recession. That is currently trending up. Looking at the Chicago Fed Financial Conditions Index. That's a sign of how tight or loose conditions are. Again, that trends up going into a recession as we see the cracks emerge in the economy. Right now, it's down near the lows. So same with the St. Louis Fed Financial Stress Index. Looks at a lot of things, credit spreads, liquidity, other signs in the economy. While it has turned up a little bit, it's still not near crisis levels. Again, looking at high yield spreads, the difference between what high yield bonds are paying over treasuries, that'll typically be elevated, trending up, going into recessions right now, 3.57. Another less known indicator that can be a good lead indicator of economic activity is how many trucks have been sold, moving goods around the economy. Again, that'll typically start diving, trending down, going into recessions as companies start buying less trucks because they foresee less orders in the nearby future. Whilst it's not really trending up, it is by no means trending down or getting distressed like we've seen in previous instances going into a recession. And let's not forget, we've still got a Fed balance sheet that's quite elevated. We're still almost two trillion above pre-COVID levels. And does anybody out there think if we get a financial emergency going into an election or another recession or some other external shock, does anybody really think 
we're not going to see quantitative ease in version 5. They'll be back to flood markets with liquidity before you can cover your shorts. So I know it's almost controversial to come out and be optimistic and be bullish and point to data that doesn't show imminent recessions and crashes. I certainly don't get as many clicks and views on my videos because I'm not out there promoting fear like the biggest channels do. However, I'm just trying to share with you guys what the actual data is, what I'm seeing and thinking, instead of trying to fill your heads with fear, because that's no way to invest in markets. Can't imagine how much money's been lost from these big influencers constantly shoving fear down their viewers' throats. However, I'm going to stick to being optimistic, looking at the glass as being half full, and looking for the opportunities, no matter what the market or environment. Sure, we could get a recession next year, but as always, I'll be looking for the markets that are trending up and that could very well be in commodities. But for some more good news, we've got lower and middle income households growing their wages faster year over year compared to higher income households. We've also got job growth in construction and goods producing industries trending up as well. And here's another data point you can show all those fear mongers is US rail traffic, amount of goods being moved around the economy. That's also increasing as well. We'll also get another look at inflation next Wednesday. Bank of America expecting CPI to come in at 0.3% month over month. They expect a little pickup in call services inflation and energy prices would leave the year over year rate unchanged at 3% and this will play a key role in what the Fed's going to do next month as well and could get the bond market moving again. But it was good to see today a real risk on move across the board. Sensitive liquidity proxy of Bitcoin ripping up today. Just about every sector finishing higher. Wide participation in a bullish rally. That is a good sign for for here and now. Same with oil stabilizing as well. Key indicator of economic demand after we saw crude inventory falling yesterday. Market's still on edge with the Middle East. We don't really have any further developments. Still waiting to see what Iran's going to do. Looks like they've been getting cold feet. Maybe worried about how big they should go. A huge amount of Western military assets sitting there ready to answer them should they do decide to go big. They may just get a little taste of their own medicine in response. And again, just to be clear, we're not out of the woods. When it comes to stock market volatility and the geopolitical situation, we've got China stockpiling key tech as there is the potential for a new US China trade war. Biden administration opposing significant tariffs on Chinese imports, including 100% on EVs, trying to protect the US industry. They've also restricted advanced chips to China, who like with Russia, are using backdoor companies and countries to keep importing advanced semiconductor chips, especially for their military use. And that's just another sign of the West's huge amount of technological leverage over China and Russia, as they still try to buy our technology through backdoors. Still the potential for a Taiwan situation next year as well. Potential for the Middle East, war to blow up. Ukraine apparently is making advances into Russian territory, and this is really gonna hinge on who takes the White House back. And it could really go either way. And look at that, Fed Fund Futures starting to have second thoughts about whether the Fed will cut 50 basis points next month, almost getting back to 50-50. And I still think that's a bit overpriced as well. I think the odds favor a 25 basis points cut. And as long as the data points that way, I'm going to continue to hold that view. So here we are on the weekly chart, the S&P 500, putting in a pretty solid green candle for this week. Would be surprised if we don't at least come down and test the lows from Monday. Who knows, maybe next week or the following week. Could find support at that 5,000 level. Otherwise, I'll be looking for support at that 48 to 46 level around this trend line, which also happens to coincide with the previous peak we got in 21. Had a few turns that level. So for sure, volatility could stay elevated going into the election. However, I'm not calling for the S&P to dive 60% like some of the biggest channels out there are. I just think the odds of that happening are probably less than 5%. So I'm going to continue to trade with the 95% odds. And for the here and now, the economy is still good. Corporate earnings are still good. That's all that really matters. Any more heightened fear or sell-offs, I'm going to use those opportunities to buy the dip as well. Thanks very much for sticking with the bullish optimistic channel. Appreciate all your support, and I hope to see you back again here tomorrow night. Cheers.